Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Depending on the time of the day, you are viewing this video. Welcome to the first vlog by Pale Blue Thoughts. We decided to name this channel as Pale Blue Thoughts because we believe it rhymes well with the pale blue dot. That famous photograph of planet Earth taken in 1990 by the space probe Voyager 1. This was done at the request of Carl Sagan, the world famous astronomer and author of the book the pale blue dot. This photograph was taken from a record distance of about 6 billion kilometers from Earth. Voyager 1 which had completed its primary mission and was leaving the solar system was commanded by NASA to turn its camera around and take one last photograph of Earth across the great expanse of space. Are you able to see Earth on that photograph? If you cannot, you may be able to see it here. In the photograph, Earth's apparent size is less than a pixel. The planet appears as a tiny dot against the vastness of space and to quote Sagan, just a tiny speck of dust suspended in a sunbeam. So we decided to name our channel Pale Blue Thoughts as a tribute to the great Carl Sagan whom we both admire very much. When you watch our entire video and the subsequent ones that we are planning to make, you will know why this name is fitting. Sagan reflected on the pale blue dot at a public lecture at Cornell and later wrote in his book that drew its name from the image. CarlSagan.com released a video four years ago on Carl Sagan's reflections. We would like to start our channel by showing you that video. It is indeed the most humbling video that we have seen in our lives. It's just a three and a half minute video, but listening to it will greatly alter your way of thinking about humans in general. It emphasizes how insignificant we really are, but how significant we consider ourselves to be. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, Every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering. Thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines. Every hunter and forager. Every hero and coward. Every creator and destroyer of civilization. Every king and peasant. Every young couple in love. Every mother and father. Hopeful child inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings how eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity. In all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. 
It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Wow, isn't it a fantastic oration? We are already witnessing how insignificant we are for the past six months due to a tiny virus which has brought the entire human civilization down to its knees and we have been witnessing things which we never have seen in our lifetimes. Dude, come on, let's forget Corona for a moment and come back to our video, please. Oh, I'm so sorry. I do get carried away by the virus sometimes. So then, on to the two questions that has mystified philosophers and thinkers right from Aristotle's time. Who are we and why are we here? The answer in our case is simple. Hello, us to introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Anand. And I am Sheen. We both are free thinkers, which means we do not follow any political party or religion. And most importantly, we do not carry any social dogma, superstitions or misconceptions. We always seek to have the right information obtained through the methods of science and do not believe in anything that does not have evidences. Now on to the next important question. Why are we here? We started this channel because we want to promote the beauty of science and to expose the pitfalls of pseudoscience. We can see all around people who are eating the fruits of science and cutting the roots of science. That is, they are enjoying the many benefits that science offers today and then disregarding, belittling or blaming the same science. We see many myths and superstitions that people follow without rhyme or reason but just based on blind faith. Our mission is to show people the rhyme and reason and beauty of pure science. We have been working hard on our spare time during this lockdown to understand how to create YouTube videos and content. So finally, we are now able to start this YouTube channel even though we are thousands of kilometers apart from each other. We urge you to watch the entire video before liking or commenting on it. And do not forget to subscribe and click on the bell notification to receive further updates. If you really like this video, please do share this with your family and friends. So what is science? Is it an ideology like communism or religion? No, it's not. It's far from that. Science is a method of thinking or a thought process. It's the correct way of confirming things. It is the most modern way of receiving information or knowledge. The scientific method can be broadly described like this. It is to observe things around you, ask the questions why, what, how, in order to find out more. Then once you have found out some answers, make a hypothesis. Then test your hypothesis. See if you are getting a valid test results a statistically significant number of times. Analyze the results to see if they are in agreement with previously confirmed theories, laws or any other hypothesis. If all tests pass under all conditions, then it becomes a theory. Finally, publish the theory for peer review and for further tests and observations. Does one need to be a scientist to understand it? No. Does one need to study science to understand it? No. Can someone who has learned, let's say, literature, language, humanities, will they be able to understand it? Yes, they can. Let's take an example. Let's take evolution as an example. How did Darwin come to conclude that all animals have evolved from simpler organisms? His knowledge at that time would have been that of a creator having created everything around him. In fact, Darwin himself has remarked that his favorite book during his undergraduate studies at Christ College was Natural Theology, written by William Paley. The same William Paley who used the watch and watchmaker analogy to substantiate his argument that everything in this world had a creator. So how did Darwin think differently and reach a conclusion about evolution? Well, first he observed that there were different traits in some of the same birds that he found on the different islands at Galapagos. This got him to think as to why should there be difference in the same sets of birds in different islands at Galapagos. He observed them again and concluded that they must have all had a common ancestor. He then tested his findings 
using bone structures and fossil records. He went where the evidences pointed to rather than where his thoughts led him to. Thus he concluded that evolution was the cause for such a diversity. He then published his findings in his most famous book on the origin of species. And that is why evolution is an established theory since it followed all the methods of science. We will not discuss evolution in detail here which we will cover up in our subsequent videos. However, we mentioned this just to give you a brief about the methodology of science. So how did people acquire wisdom in olden times? They got it through four means – tradition, authority, dogma and revelation. A lot of times we blindly believe what has been handed over to us as tradition and we do it without questioning. When I was young, I was told not to cut my fingernails during night or probably not to sleep with my head facing north. When I asked them why, the answer I got was that it was tradition. I am sure all of you would have acquired some pulse of wisdom like that from your earlier generation. This is one of the ways how Homo sapiens sapiens acquired knowledge in olden times. Tradition. Second is authority. There are many authoritarian figures in our society. We have all heard of speeches which were made by religious leaders or political leaders. However, when it comes to science, just because someone has said something doesn't make it scientific. For example, let's say Einstein, who is regarded as an eminent scientist, has said something at some point. We have all the right to turn around and ask, so what? Einstein can say anything. Science does not have messengers, prophets, gods or authorities. Just because someone has said something doesn't make it valid. For it to be valid, it has to be proven using the methods of science and what has been said can stand on its own. Aristotle once wrote that men have more teeth than women. He must have looked at the teeth of his wife Pythias and then concluded that. Perhaps Pythias had lost some of her teeth during her lifetime. Had he looked at a few more samples, then he would not have made that error. That's funny really. So was Aristotle an ignorant person? No, he wasn't. In fact, he was the most brilliant man of his times. The problem was that he used the methods available at that time to reach a conclusion or to gain knowledge. He didn't have science to test results to guide his thinking. The third one is dogma. What is dogma? Dogma simply is an idea or a principle or a principle laid out by a person of authority as being true. For example, religion is a dogma. Ideologies like communism, fascism, Gandhism, etc. are examples of dogmas. Someone who blindly believes in a dogma, his vision is limited to that dogma. He cannot go beyond that. The last one is revelation. We've all heard of tuition. We've all gone to school, gone to colleges and learnt a lot of things from there. Some things we remember, some things we forget and the process continues. However, in traditional human civilizations, tuition was considered a lesser form of acquiring knowledge. They thought that they had a higher form of acquiring knowledge which was through intuition. Intuition is the receiving of knowledge from an unseen, unknown source. It is the ability to acquire knowledge instinctively without the need for creative reasoning. You sit and meditate at some place, let's say a forest or a mountain top in those days, and a Wi-Fi connection is established between your mind and the unseen, unknown force. You sit there thinking about the entity and the knowledge enters through the Wi-Fi. There are no books, no learnings. It is just click, download, installed. These sacred people then relate their experience and present it as the ultimate knowledge, which when questioned, they simply say that this is beyond the common man's level of thinking or understanding, which basically is tuition. But theirs is intuition, which is beyond or something outside the realms of understanding. If you look very closely at such revelations, they come very close to a poetic or artistic imagination. More on this later. These days you hear of many claims made by people who claim that everything existed in their sacred texts. And what science finds out today has already been foretold by our ancient sages or by their messengers. Then they start to talk about the great Indus Valley civilization, the origin of the universe, the ancient medicine system, the Big Bang Theory, traveling to outer space, time travel, and finally, the all-purpose solution to all ailments, Gangajal and cow urine. The important thing to note here is that 
They talk about all this in the same vein, as a matter of fact, as if they had known everything long time ago and the current generation is yet to find out or are late to find out. It is important to note that the knowledge of human civilizations have been limited to the extent of scientific knowledge and technology that were available to them during the different eras in history. For example, it is unwise to assume that in a society which did not have paper to write on actually flew aircraft from one part of the world to another. Or it is also foolish to assume that in a world where there were no satellites, people could send electronic signals from one location to another. Because for that to happen, a lot of supporting technologies needs to be present. For example, let us say that you are streaming a live broadcast. You first need a device to capture the electromagnetic radiation which is coming from the live event that you are recording. Send it to a geostationary satellite which is located miles above the earth. It has to then redirect it to an antenna which is present on the ground and that antenna has to send the electromagnetic signals to a television set which can reconvert these electromagnetic signals into a visible light spectrum. So you see there is a need for a lot of supporting technologies that need to be present before we can make a complex system. If you understand it then it is easy not to fall prey for the fallacy of rosy retrospection that is a psychological phenomenon where people judge the past disproportionately positively than they judge the present. Most of Indians are born with the psychological disease. People believe that the sages knew everything, which included that the sun revolves around the earth when all the time the earth was happily revolving around the sun. This is just one of the fallacies that we will definitely touch upon in the coming days. We live in a world where people turn off mobile phones in the night because they got a WhatsApp message saying that cosmic rays are passing close to the earth and your little mobile phone is going to capture them all and cause harm to your body. There are many people who eat leaves that the naturopaths give them thinking that it will cure cancer and the latest one doing rounds putting mustard oil in your nose will make you get rid of the coronavirus. So why do people fall for this? And we are talking about educated people who would not think twice before forwarding any fake messages or pen down any fallacies on Facebook or any other social media. Does being educated help you to have a better scientific mind? Not really. ISRO scientists have been known to send prototypes of the satellites that they are going to launch to Tirupati to seek divine blessings. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you may be laughing. Well, you are laughing at the top-notch scientists who have degrees in aeronautical engineering and missile technology. Mind it. We also have certain central ministers who buy fighter jets to squeeze lemons. We are living in a world where people believe that beating utensils or chanting Go Corona Go will get rid of the virus. This proves that education has got nothing to do with how science sits within one's head. All it amounts to is the presence or the lack of something called as scientific temper. So what is scientific temper and why is it so important? Scientific temper is a way of thinking. It is an attitude that one needs to develop. We would even go one step further and say that it's a way of life which one needs to adhere to. Scientific temper describes an attitude which involves application of logic. Discussions, analysis, arguments, etc. are vital parts of scientific temper. Elements of equality, fairness and democracy, etc. are then built into it. Science, literacy, education have nothing much to do on whether you will have a scientific temper or not. It is a way of life which uses a scientific method which we described earlier. However, there is a difference between scientific knowledge and scientific temper. You normally see scientists and you might tend to think that scientific temper is something that they have. If you thought like that, then you are wrong. Let's take a simple example. You go to the market to buy fish. You go daily and then you finally have a big bulk of fish. Moreover, you need to go out daily to buy fish. But what at the end of the day? All you have is a freezer full of fish. Please don't think this is scientific temper. That is scientific knowledge which you had been collecting. Just because one would have a BSc, MSc or a PhD in science, that doesn't mean 
that you will definitely have scientific temper. This is like buying of the fish example. You shouldn't keep buying the fish daily. You should learn how to fish. Then you wouldn't need to go out daily and buy fish. You can fish for yourself whenever you need it. That's the difference between scientific temper and scientific knowledge. People who just have scientific knowledge may have learnt a lot by heart or maybe written papers on it. And that is the reason why some people, even though they are well educated, they still send prototypes to seek divine blessings or maybe break a coconut before sending a rocket to space. Other developed countries don't do this, but still their rocket reached the destination just like us. Our Prime Minister of India, late Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, was the first to use the word scientific temper in 1946. He later gave a descriptive explanation in his famous book, The Discovery of India. We quote, What is needed is a scientific approach, the adventurous and yet critical temper of science, the search for truth and new knowledge, the refusal to accept anything without testing and trial, the capacity to change previous conclusions in the face of new evidence, the reliance on observed fact and not on preconceived theory, the hard discipline of the mind. All this is necessary, not merely for the application of science, but for life itself and the solution to its many problems. Nehru wanted that scientific temper should characterize all Indians. He envisioned that the spread of scientific temper would be accompanied by the shrinking of the domain of religion. He also stated that it is science alone that can solve the problems of illiteracy, insanitation, hunger, poverty, of superstitions, customs, traditions, of vast resources running to waste, and of a rich country inhabited by starving people. Who indeed can afford to ignore science today? At every turn, we seek its aid, Nehru said. And the most important thing to note is that for one to acquire scientific temper, one does not need to study any branch of science. That is, a person who has studied, let's say, language, literature, humanities, history, can have the same or more scientific temper than a person who has learned physics, chemistry and biology. How awesome is that? And now we come to the most critical part of our video. And this is why we took up this topic as our first. The Constitution of India encourages the citizen of India to have 11 fundamental duties as a citizen towards the country. And one of it is to have scientific temper. According to the fundamental duties under Article 51AH, it shall be the duty of every citizen of India to develop a scientific temper, humanism and the spirit of enquiry and reform. It is one of the only constitutions that puts thinking scientifically as one of the fundamental duties of the citizen. So by cultivating a scientific temper, you are actually displaying patriotism. That is, you are actually following the Indian constitution. The person who coined the word definitely had a say in putting this article in the constitution. But to make it a fundamental duty, that definitely is a masterstroke. But are we fostering a scientific outlook or science-mindedness in our life? Even in schools and colleges, usually the teacher is so busy delivering the content, carrying out fixed process or procedures of experimentation, that the aim of fostering a spirit of discovery remains unfulfilled. Besides, we are so obsessed with right answers that even in practical classes, Students are preoccupied with the task of getting the expected reading or result instead of observing changes with an open mind. We are more syllabus oriented, we are more marks oriented, but we are not curiosity oriented. There are thousands of things happening around you. Do you seek to find answers to any of them? How many of you know why is there a hole in the middle of a donut or a vada? Or why does chapati puff? Or why do we have seasons? Everyone will agree that the earth is round. Now if I were to ask the question, how can you say that the earth is round, would you be able to come up with a definite answer? It is high school science, but when posed with the question, how can you tell the earth is round, can you categorically give an answer? Something to think for yourself. We don't know the answers to many of these questions because we blindly follow what has been told to us. Our fathers did it, their fathers did it and they didn't question. But today we have Google. We didn't have Google in our younger days. 
But do we seek to find answers to all these questions? By the way, if you don't know the answers to the questions that we post, you can write to us and we'll be happy to answer them scientifically. The problem is seeking answers to things which happen around you may not benefit you in any manner at all. You may not get a job, earn money or a promotion and definitely not good marks in school. That's because someone has been doing it and you blindly copy it without pausing to think why you are doing it. Isn't that a robotic behavior? Do you want to be a humanoid or a human? When we were children, we were not given an opportunity to examine different viewpoints and arrive at their own interpretations. We brainwashed entire generations with what we wanted them to think as per the ideologies of a religious sect or of a political party. Moreover, we carefully sanitized our history textbooks so that various sentiments are not heard. How far do we intend to promote this kind of ignorance? We seem to have forgotten our visionary PM who once said, science can help feed and clothe millions. And now we are fighting over cow politics and where a temple needs to be built. The effects of not having a scientific temper goes much beyond just embracing superstitions. Cultures have been dogmatized because of this. Social dogmas take root because of this. Take for example the discrimination based on color, white versus black. If people had a little bit of scientific temper, they would have then realized that the people living in tropical climates would have received a greater amount of sunlight and this would lead to an increased production of melanin the hormone which gives the dark color to hair and your body. If they understood it, would they be a bit more, if not a lot more considerate when judging people by their color? Okay, let me ask you a question. What color is your hair? If you are living in the tropics, you would probably jump up and say black. Well, no, it is white. It is just that because you are living in the tropics, you are getting a lot more sunlight and that increases the production of melanin which gives a darker color to your skin and hair. Sounds crazy? Well, let me prove it to you. As you grow older, the production of melanin decreases and finally comes to a stop. As it decreases, what color does your hair change to? It goes back to its natural color, white. Don't tell me you didn't know this. If you didn't, it is time to visit your local doctor and get that scientific temper vaccination shot. The point is, if you knew this scientific fact, which you will find in standard 7 textbooks, then the bridges politics have created is getting washed down the drain. And you will start looking at people in a different light altogether rather than the color of their skin. This is the truth. Even if you try to talk in a politically correct manner and try to bring about social reformations based on social status, it is not going to work as much as when you listen to science, when it brings to light the reason behind why some people are born black and why some white. Now judge people based on this evidence rather than social dogma and then see the difference. That is the beauty of scientific temper that goes way beyond scientific principles and equations and it is something that can be implemented in all walks of life. It is an attitude to think in a scientific manner and arrive at conclusions to the most demanding questions that are posed in life. If you think in a scientific manner, you are bound to be 100% right all the time. A lot of people are skeptical about the progress that India has made in the field of science and technology. Indeed, we have made breakthrough strides in the fields of agriculture, space exploration, life expectancy and standard of living. However, we still have scientists and learned men who often break a coconut before taking out their new car. It seems that we are all set to reach the moon and Mars, but our scientific temper has not left our front doors. The year 2010-20 has been declared as the decade of innovation. However, in the same decade, we have some scientists making some really extraordinary claims. Like, we have live streaming of battles. We had made interstellar journeys on planes 5000 years ago. We knew plastic surgery. And we had even made a god using plastic surgery. Drinking of cow urine has medicinal properties and so on and on. We also saw a steep increase in people believing in pseudosciences like astrology, homeopathy and other alternative medicines, vastu, paranormal, organic farming, yoga and intelligent creation. We will be discussing these scams in our subsequent videos.
The gross budgetary support for science and technology has significantly increased during the last decade. However, the value of science in people has remained poor as ever. We still have more number of religious places than the total number of hospitals and schools put together. The recent coronavirus pandemic has clearly taught the world that it can definitely run without temples, mosques and churches, but it cannot survive without hospitals. Yet, once this is all over, we will still have more number of people at our doorsteps seeking money for these religious institutions rather than for building schools and hospitals. Public understanding of science is an important dimension to introducing and getting the benefits of modern science and technology to the people. Scientific temper needs to be promoted across all sections of the society systematically. Ours is a small attempt to do that and to spread awareness among the general public about the benefits of having scientific temper. We know that a believer will continue to believe in what has been told to him because of blind faith and that changing perceptions are difficult. However, we take inspiration from our very own experiences that led to a change in the way we think and we will continue to promote the miracles of science in the subsequent videos that we are planning to release. We do this with the intention of increasing a people's scientific temper. We will leave you with a parting thought by Steven Weinberg. Steven Weinberg is an American theoretical physicist and a Nobel laureate in physics for his experiments in finding out the interactions between elementary particles. We leave space in the comment section for you to pen your comments on our video. Please do watch our entire video before you comment, else your comments may be lopsided. So please follow the method of scientific temper and watch the entire video before you form an opinion. And please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you'll be notified about our further videos. Please do share our video with your family and friends to promote us further. We would also like to thank you for your patience watching of this vlog. We will be back soon with another vlog on busting misconceptions that prevail in our society. Your feedback is invaluable to us as this is our first attempt. Till we meet again, keep that scientific temper flowing.